flat rate. I like being paid flat rate. I would count my steps doing a job to make sure I was doing it the most efficient way I could. Count my steps. I bought an alignment machine. I had never done an alignment before, so I learned how to do it, and then I'm subconsciously counting my steps so I can do it in the most efficient way possible. No extra steps, because you see guys running around. They're not efficient. They're just wasting time. I'd rather walk at a reasonable pace and take no extra steps because I know I'm doing it in the most efficient way possible. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another exciting, thought-provoking episode of the Jaded Mechanic Podcast. My name's Jeff, and I'd like to thank you for joining me on this journey of reflection and insight into the toils and triumphs of a career in automotive repair. After more than 20 years of skin knuckles and tool debt, I want to share my perspectives and hear other people's thoughts about our industry. So pour yourself a strong coffee or grab a cold Canadian beer and get ready for some great conversation. Welcome back, everybody. So I got, uh, here I am in Blowing Rock, North Carolina. It is the 4th of July, America. God bless America. God bless America. This is my first ever 4th in America. It's a big Welcome. deal for me. Thank you very much. Uh, our, our big day was the 1st. That's that our Canada that day. Earlier in the week, right? Yeah, yeah. Z- July 1st. So um, who have I got sitting with me? Start. We'll go to, we'll go to my left. Okay. Okay. Um, your other left or that left? This left. This left, okay. American uh, left or Canadian left? Uh, it's the same. The metric, one you got, same metric as, or standard? The same as the uh, one you got your drink called in. Copy that. Uh, this is Mike Allen from yes. Carfix and from the Automotive Service and Tire Alliance. Yeah. Uh, uh, an, old, an old friend we just had you recently. Yeah, it was a yeah. lot of fun. Yeah, good, good. And I'm Brian Kerwin. I own Pete's Garage. And Brian. you used to work with Mike Allen oh, well, this 20 is, this years is, ago. This is why we're excited. So, Brian, this is the first time that I've ever met you. Um and we started an interesting conversation. There's been a lot of interesting conversations started an hour ago um, with you asking me, because you just recently listened to the podcast that Mike and I recorded. It got dropped, and you really enjoyed it, and you were very complimentary and saying, and you asked me what I thought about flat rate. <laughs> right? So, you know, the backstory is that my flat rate and my first introduction of, to who Mr. Mike Allen said to my left was is that he was a guy that I wanted to punch in the mouth because, you know, um, the way, you know, he, he goes on, or was led to believe through my initial impression it was that he wanted to pay everybody flat rate and flat rate was the only way to be and it was the bestest thing in the world. And I've since I've come to know Mike and, and have lots of good conversation with Mike is that that's not what he thinks, right? But you guys have some backstory. There's some history between you two. We have the same backstory. Yeah. So let's let's hear about that because this is I mean, and we're not trying this will be no incrimination. You're not gonna be arrested. <laughs> You know, whatever. If, if There's you have a statute some, of limitations yes, to most of what we do. If you do. have some old girlfriends that hear something that they're not supposed to hear about, I, I'm not part of that. That's not the point of fear. The point of fear is the current uh, current okay. yes. uh, partner right. hearing things that they're not supposed to hear. <laughs> exactly. So um, give us kind of your, how you two are linked. Um, how, you know, how did that work out? So I went to work for James, Mike's dad. When I was 16, I was working for another independent and they let me go and i went to lunch uh-huh. and i came back from lunch he's like well you can't work here anymore you work down the street so i just walked down there and james shook my hand and gave me a job changing tires so they they terminated you or they saw that you were a better fit down at, at james I, I was 16 i had gotten the job um just through high school uh-huh. and they said they didn't need me right where were you uh it, it, jurgens <laughs> yeah Oh, so that they still exist there there in Carbro. Okay. Um really nice guy. His name was Brian with a Y too, so you right. know I, I got to give him that. But it, it, that's how I met the Allens was he he didn't need me anymore but thought enough of me that he found me another job. Well, that so, was kind of cool. So and and I figured I'd, it was your mouth that got you fired. No. Hmm, yeah. <laughs> Y'all see my hand go up? That's the biggest reason I've ever been fired. That's a, a for, you know, my mouth is is yeah. has done me a lot of good and also hurt me sometimes right. in the past too. So you got it, Mr. Mike's father, James, mm-hmm. immediately put you to work. Yes, just changing tires and oil changes, and that was it. Yeah. And that was back when it was Mayhem Motors, like uh-huh. Mike talked about, 100, 120 cars a day. Um, 
just rolling them through. Yeah. Moved a ton of tires. And, and, and like I told you earlier when we were talking, I remember, I think it went long after James had met Kelly Bennett. Mm-hmm. And then we were going to have a $100 average ticket, and everybody's like, he's out of his mind. There's no way we're going to do it. Because right. <laughs> what, would, what would the average number have been that back in then, that time, Mike? Oh. Like in the 80s. Yeah. What, what year was that? That was 97 that no, you saw the then? That's probably right, because yeah. I was in high school when I worked for your dad, and I graduated in 98. Okay. Yeah. So it probably was 75, 80 bucks at the time. And you and the goal was we're going to be a, we're going to have a hundred average. Well, I think when it hit seventy five eighty dollars, we had grown it to seventy five eighty dollars. I think and, there was a good chance it was worse than that. And and we were with. doing this with handwritten repair orders, you know, uh, in triplicate. And uh, I remember uh, we would show up to the shop, and there'd be a line of ten or eleven people. They'd like get to the shop well before any of the employees, so that they could be first in line because we had such high volume. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like a it was like a game they played to try to so get in and out quickly. What drove the volume pricing? Uh, I mean, that's a good the, question. Good reputation, good right? reputation. Um, yeah. We uh, so dad grew up in my dad's shop, yes. right? Yeah. And one of his, one of his sayings was, uh, you, know, "You can shear a sheep a dozen times, and I'll thank you for the service. You can only slaughter it once, yes. right?" Uh, so, you know, cars break enough on their own. You don't have to make shit up, mm-hmm. right? Just be nice, tell the truth, mm-hmm. and everything else works out. And so, you know, our our industry has the reputation it has for a reason. Uh, we earned it. We didn't participate in a lot of the causal factors of that reputation. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, word spreads. So, because so, I, I meant to ask from the last time, I, I get the impression that your father wasn't necessarily the cheapest shop around, even back then. Not no, even close. I, he was... I mean, it was very tire-minded business, so right. price consciousness was a thing. Um, but I don't think he ever tried to be the cheapest tire mm-hmm. guy in town. You know, we if you tr- if you go down that path far enough, uh, and then you start competing with the used tire guys. You right? get a very pe- very <laughs> yeah. short piece of rope to hang yourself yeah. with, is what I said. So, Brian, you're you're young, and you, and you get in there with with Mike and James, and you and Mike are the same age. James well, I wasn't really there yet. Oh, no, no, he wasn't. When I first started... Uh, I was away in college. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think we worked together some in the in the summers. Yeah, yeah, I would work there in the summer, yeah. And then I also went to college, and then I came back in January of 2000, and uh, you were still probably a, a year or more later before yeah, you I, came back I to I came back service. like February of 2002 that, is when that I came sounds back. sounds right. Uh, and... Whoa. Yeah. I was. Honestly, for me, it seems like yesterday. It really does. <laughs> because when I think about where I was in 02, I was making the transition from, like you and I were talking, I was moving out of a, a heavy truck shop into the automotive sector side of it all. And and a lot of change and a lot of new things to learn. And, and you and I talked about in 2002, I was working in a shop for $10 an hour. And I was finishing up my last intake of, of our trade represent records our trade development program our apprenticeship program in in canada and i was finishing off my my final intake i was making ten dollars an hour and i went to class with a bunch of guys that were there that had come from dealerships and they were making 15 16 dollars an hour and uh, and you know you you get to know you sit around in class and you start talking to people and you're like okay they're no smarter than me like and in some things on on because my background in the truck shop had been like i had to do a lot of wiring on trailers a lot of wiring on trucks i was given some pretty big repair responsibilities to do so i i would be you know in some some of the advanced stuff i was i was advanced and these guys would be like why are you working for such little money right so when i like you and i discussed when my, it was my final intake was done i was going to go back to that shop because the intake meeting where you're out of class right you're out, off the job you go to school as if you're going to school every day, eight hours a day, sit through class, take your final, learn the, the final intake of drivability electrical, Ohm's Law at advanced level, all kind of stuff. And they're like, you know, you, you, you need to go get that job at the dealership. And I'd heard things about the dealerships and, and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, oh, that's got a bad connotation because a lot of the, the guy that mentored me at that little shop, he'd been a former dealer mechanic. And he told me it's going to chew you up and spit you out. You're going to. I'm like, oh man, at ten bucks an hour, I can't. 
Like, I, I can't afford to buy tools. I would, there would be days I'd go in and I'd need a tool to do a job, and it would cost more to buy the tool than I had worked that, than I, what I earned that day. Man. Right? Mm-hmm. I can still remember it was a Geo Metro <coughs> sitting on the hoist, and it had exhaust studs that broke off on the Y pipe. And this is before we talked about my welding of getting bolts out. The studs broke off, and I needed a stud remover, stud extractor that snap on truck like they always seem to do shoves up at the most appropriate time and i walk <laughs> out there and i buy the stud extractor it was 95 dollars. four dollars a week for the rest of your life yeah Nin- <laughs> 95 bucks for that stud extractor. i still have it it's a great tool i'm not trying to say i still use it like it wasn't i was miffed with it i would have put 15 dollars in my pocket if i had stayed home that day at 10 dollars a day an hour you see what I mean? Oh, well, yeah. yeah. That's right? Really so that's point. when the light bulb went off for me. So when I went back and saw my boss and I gave him my notice because I decided I'm going to take the job at the dealership. And the dealership just wanted me. They weren't worried about what I, they're just like, we need it. We need a person. When I went back, my boss said, well, I was going to pay you 11. So from then on, I, I jumped both feet into the dealership. So, and this is not about me. This is about you. But so how did you find Mr. Allen? Compared to your previous employer, uh, Jurgens is a good shop. Yeah, I mean, I mean, th- they do fine. Um, it, it was a really short sample mm-hmm. working for Jurgen before uh, you know I went to work for James because you know in Florida is where I started school, and we were way advanced over North Carolina. We took seven classes a day, and when I come up here, we only had to do six. So I didn't want to graduate early. Yeah. So I went to school until lunch. And then I had to go to work right. through the school. So I, you know, take four classes in the morning, go home, eat lunch, and then go to work every day. And I was at Jurgens. And then I think it was in the summer was when he got me the job at Chapel Hill Tire at the time for for James. Mm-hmm. But no, he was fine to work at. Yeah, you know, I I met you know a couple old school mechanics that were good at fixing cars. And yeah, yeah. Did you was there when you left, Dad? Did you go straight to Pete's, or was there anything in between? So, yeah, I was retired for a year and a half. Is that when you broke yourself, or no, no, no? So broke yourself. So I, that's I, another story. <laughs> okay. I guess for about five years, I kind of changed oil and tires, and then I was doing trailers and hitches, a little bit of exhaust work, which I wasn't good at. Mm-hmm. And then we actually had a unsanctioned company outing. And uh, I didn't walk for two months afterwards due to a broken ankle. So I had a lot of time to sit. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know. You were a different man when you came back from that. Think about my career. Yeah. So I was 25. So it's like, you know, if you want to do this, let's make the most of it. So when I came back, you know, I was hungry. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to do exhaust and trailers anymore, which exhaust work, uh, I I wasn't good at. It it wasn't a good fit for me. So I just started doing light mechanical work and, you know. I wanted to go to training. That was when um, they were transitioning from, like I told you earlier, just yeah. really easy stuff. So the I got in on the ground floor going to training for check engine lights, um, uh, air conditioning, Bosch imagine. training, yeah. air conditioning. You know, I did the first clutch in probably 10 or 15 years. And um, it, it just the timing was right. Mm-hmm. You know, I needed that, that injury for a little quiet reflection to be yeah. like hey it's time to get your life together you're 25 years old and at that point i said you know i'm going to give it five years and we're going to put our head down and see how far we can go with this and i think i went a long way and then yeah you know i was 30 and, and i just felt like it was time for a change so i just quit and i didn't have anything else lined up so i i was home for a year and a half and you Matt, said you were kind of doing a little bit of work at home. Yeah, I you had a big a, garage at home. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I had a, a lady friend who paid the household bills. I made the house payment. It didn't take a lot of money to keep me up. And, mm-hmm. you know, I traveled, I fished, I had yeah. a real good time. And you, and you worked on cars and did a little bit more probably than what you had been exposed to or given the opportunity to do, right? Of, right. Of, uh, you get a little more of what you'd learned do some ac work do a little bit of drivability check engine light in the beer you know i remember what it was like in 2002 those cars were i don't want to say they were easier to fix but i mean there's less wires right oh yeah there's less wires put it so you know um and I, that's not throwing shade because i mean when you look at what a, a, a scan tool in 2002 what it would still was what you had to work with say that was a 1991 you're working on you i didn't still have, have it yeah you don't have i got one too <laughs> and it's like you didn't have a lot to go on right so right. you kind of but so that was your first take at your own kind of employment like you're you're not an official shop owner 
But no, you're kind of setting I, up I, your own yeah, client, just kind of playing. Yeah. There wasn't anything real serious about yeah. it. And how did you end up buying Pete's? What's so, the story on so Martin Terry, who you know, yeah. who owned, owned a transmission shop, said, hey, Brian, do you want to have your house back? Because I will say that when you work from home, mm-hmm. there, there is no privacy. No. People show up at 9 o'clock on a Sunday evening and want their oil changed and yeah. stuff like that. Or you come home and there's a, a bunch of cars at your parking spot <laughs> that have been dropped yeah. off, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So um, he said, Pete wants to retire, and Pete had a, a shop. Uh, we would send some work to him he'd rebuild rear ends work on old weird stuff Mm -hmm. you know nothing exotic yeah so um that was in february of 2012 my brother had graduated uh, college in december of 2011 and he was purposefully not getting a job because we had a snowboarding trip planned for the third week in february so first week of february we find out about the shop i talked to him he wants to do it we get everything in order we go snowboarding in march 1st he and I are shop owners in right. Durham with no clue. No but clue. Did your brother have any experience in the industry other than just helping you out at the house? Zero. Yeah. Wow. And you take him on as a partner. Exactly. How? Uh, so would you do that again? That's a good question. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I mean, he and I are very different. So uh-huh. we're good partners. We complement each other. Um, he lets me run the show, mm-hmm. and, of, and of course, I don't do anything without him or, or, or against him. We just we get along really, really well. Right. And, and currently, in the way that our business is, I write service and kind of run the show, and he and he's a tech. But yeah. you know, we're hoping to grow and expand because we bought a new shop a year ago, so we got the security of owning our own building. So his role is going to change. My role is going to change. It's time, time so, to have a grown-up business. Well, so you to have speak. two locations now, or you're just going to a bigger location that's actually going to be. It, it, it's actually a smaller location than the okay. one we rented, but it's it's Ours. the old shop was four bays laid out poorly, right? And then this shop is five bays with AC, and we own it, so we have the stability of owning the building, which right. is, is big for us. Key, yeah. So. While you've been doing on that, say we're on that point in your in your career, where are you? Like you guys are still you're staying close, or was there a friendship there that was always been like? I mean, you've known each other a long time. So we were we were tight. We ran together close for many years, uh, and then I got married and started a family, mm-hmm. and we kind of drifted after he left dad's business. Uh, I would say there was you know five or six years there where you know if, if we bumped into each other it would have been perfectly fine but we didn't communicate a lot right and then we reconnected recently at ASTE um, and uh, you know Brian uh, I think you're at a point where you're ready for like the next level of evolution in your business um, and uh, that led to some conversations between the two of us and it's just like we picked up where we dropped so off, right? when you went to ASD, Brian, what kind of courses did you take? Because we've all heard kind of Lucas talk about how ASD was life changing for him, and ASD was life changing for me. That's just not me saying that. That is legit. I would not be sitting here if I had not gone to ASD. So when you went, same for me. I mean, yeah. I, I I went there and then I joined ASTA, mm-hmm. and then I went to Wilmington, and now I'm here. I mean, yeah. I'm really enjoying it, and and I think it's pushing me to do a lot of good things for my business. Yeah. Um, Are you going to go to any technical classes this year? Zero. <laughs> that was going to be what my segue into the question was going to be, because I want to think maybe when you went last year, you probably took some technical training. I didn't. No? I didn't. You I, took I, I'm out of that. Yeah. It was all business stuff. Yeah. It has to be. You yeah. know, my body won't let me turn wrenches again. If I was forced to turn wrenches again, I'd starve. Yeah. I just I can't do it. Again. From a production standpoint. Yeah, I, yeah. I just got too many problems. I mean, I was good at it when I did it, but those that, that's past. I, I hear mean, you, brother. I'm the same way, right? Like, I mean, we were talking earlier. My shop now is not one that is on me about how many hours. Why did it take that long? How many hours did you? We don't clock that. You know what I mean? They give me a broken car or a broken bus, and I fix it, and I would fix it well, and I do a really good job, and they just say thank you, and I, I collect a paycheck. You know, if, if they want to... Uh, discount the labor on a job to to sell the job it doesn't affect me if they want to if they seem to go overboard on an estimate and i knock it out in half the time i don't know about it you know what i mean it is all neutral so, i'm not saying that that's so you don't even know how many hours are on a ticket when you get it i do from the standpoint of i know okay so if i'm going to put a set of control arms and some tie rods and a steering rack and a thing i i look up the labor and know what it's supposed to be but it's like I could get pulled off that job five times to do other things. You know how that can go, right? It can 
screw your flow up. At the end of the job, there isn't like I'm I'm punching a ticket to know how whether I was over on that or under. Right, it's just I got it done by the time frame that we needed to get it done by, and we got all the other work that came in and out. I got that done, so I don't really know. Excuse me, I don't really know um, if I go over or if I do drastically under, and my production is through the roof or not. Nobody, nobody's, nobody's really making me completely aware of that. It's a crazy concept, isn't it? I think that that's bad business. <laughs> It, it's because it, he's not paid flat rate. Yeah. Well, so I can t- I can tell you I'll, I'll let you in on why that is, Mike. Is because you got to remember sometimes a lot of what my work might be is that it's my boss that owns that piece of equipment, that bus, because it's his fleet company, right? Yeah. So he is my his company. And that's a different animal. It is his company. Is it's it's a bus load of or it's a fleet of buses that are are going on tours all the time, right? Whether it's to take some senior citizens to the casino or whether it's to take. Um, we do a lot of the local university team. Uh, we might be taking them three hours away for a hockey game or something like that. So he's not, whatever we do on his equipment to repair it in-house is saving him money. So he doesn't get too wrapped up in about, I could have had that done cheaper at, say, the truck center shop in town because they couldn't look at him for a month. You know what I mean? We can get it done that day and done and gone. Yeah. Right? So it's not a traditional but- standpoint of... So what, one of the things we talked about in the podcast mm-hmm. with you and I was that the reason I didn't understand the vitriol towards flat rate was because my entire experience and exposure was just in my dad's business right. and then my own. Um, and, and once I learned about what your experience was in the dealerships and yep. what you know uh, Brian Pollock's experiences mm-hmm. have been, um, I was like, oh, well, shit, that makes sense, right? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, a, a totally salary uh, position like what you're describing, it makes sense in what you're describing, mm-hmm. where you're working for the dude who's servicing the fleet that he owns yep. that's providing. So it's a small part of a larger entity, right? Yep. But if it was just a general repair shop working on you know, Chevys and Fords and yep. Hondas and Toyotas, it's harder to make that work. Now we have other fleets to come in and we're tasked with fixing mm-hmm. them as well. But again, like fleet work is very much where they don't get really super analytical about how many hours should it take to do that. Because a lot of what a fleet is, a lot of it is it's a modified vehicle, right? Whether we talk about, they've got a, they've got a truck out there right now. I was looking at it with Terry yesterday and it's got like, they're doing just um, a drive shaft you join in it. And I think there was something else. Well, it, because of it hauls Christmas trees around and it's got a dump box and everything else on it and it moves really slow and it's in the mud most of the time. It's got an aftermarket oil cooler underneath it that is massive, huge. Well, that adds some variables when you're doing a U-joint in it, right? Or a hanger bearing or anything else like that. So times that by every car almost that comes into my shop and the, the quoted time is not really all that particular. We have a lot of our customers that it's almost just like, Here's a blank check, you know, be respectful. Yeah, it, and, is what and, it is within reason. And get it done. And we do that. And I don't think we're coming out where it's like you had six and we charge them four. I think there's more often than not we probably had six and we did we charge six. You know, which you're gonna have a hundred experts that are gonna tell you that's not good enough. We have we have glowing testimonies from our customers about the quality of work that we do, how upfront and honest we are with them. And they would recommend us to a hundred other people. So we got to get away from that. I think sometimes with, you've heard me talk about how the P word, and you and I discussed this at, at, before you showed up. I, it, it is still a very negative connotation for me about. I'm, I'm sorry, which P word? Production. Okay. I like proficiency. If we're going to use the, the P words, I like proficiency better. Show me what you can actually do, right? Because if, if you can solve a problem, solving problems is great. I can find a guy that needs to hang apart. I need problem solving, right? And we talked about, you asked me the question of what, what's it like, you know, the rust belt that I live in versus down here. And we were laughing. Oh, I couldn't at, imagine. We were Jeez. laughing at Mr. Lucas's little tiny training torches that that's their torch set versus what we have one of them in a service vehicle, right? And then we would have, we have a giant set of tanks and a, and a big torch. And like we have a saying, it, it can't be stuck if it's liquid. You know, like if you get it hot enough and you get her molten, <laughs> oh, it, it makes me stuck. sad thinking about the rust issues you deal with. But, you know, it, it is just one of those things. I have grown up in that. You know what I mean? Like my father was a collision tech. You know, so, you can move. 
I mean, we have none of those issues. <laughs> North Carolina is awesome. It, it, Come it, on down. Yeah, I'm it's, hiring. It's tempting. <laughs> um, so I grew up in it. So it's just part of what we do. Brian Brian Pollock talks about it as well. You just you just do. It's just your job. Yeah, you it's just, just do your it. normal. Yeah. You know, and so does that add time to the job? Oh, for sure. But where I get into the problem, and I can still remember this. This is a funny thing. So we talk sometimes. I was at a dealer, and I heard somebody talking in a conversation earlier about how if they were to add, what did he say, one hour for every, or 10%, add 10% for every year that it was older than 10 years old, right? He said, if it was 10 years old, you're adding 100% more labor at 10% per hour for every year that it's above that. He's like, what a neat concept. Because I can remember years ago, I did a rear caravan, or I did a caravan rear exhaust manifold. The job came in pre-quoted. I never got to inspect the job. And it was... 10 years old it had been to the local chain store and the local chain store had given the estimate of that was not 3.8 hours to do that rear manifold in that in that v they needed six hours because of the condition of the bolts my service advisor out front strictly told them if it's 3.8 we'll do it for 3.8 and i got handed the ticket well i can tell you that it was every 10 mil nut and stud on that was not 10 mil anymore it was eight nine i think i even had a couple of seven and this was a shop that i didn't have a welder in to use so I was doing it the old school way of pounding on sockets and pouring the heat to it and turning it off. I had well over double that ticket. Well over double the time. 3.8. I was on that all day. I got it done. What did I do? I donated four hours of my labor. See, so you should have the autonomy and the authority in your workplace to say, I'm not going to do this for that many hours because mm-hmm. that's not appropriate. Right. Um and I mean, I I can't fathom how shops keep technicians doing that to them. That's why we have a. Yeah. It's a contributing factor to why we have such a shortage, right? Because they tell um, you, Mike, you're going to make it up on the next one. You never do. When, In a dealership, you can. Well, when I worked for James, yeah, I would price all my own labor. Do mm-hmm. you remember that? Yeah. Well, that's I what would write get. it down. It needs brakes. This is what it pays. It needs a water pump, belt, shocks. Yeah. And I'd have a time there. Mm-hmm. And I feel like most of the service advisors appreciated that because you didn't have to look it up. Yeah. Because well, I, that's I wasn't, company policy at Carfix now. Really? Technicians build their estimates, and they 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 put the, the, the jobs on the ticket, and they put the labor times on there. And I, I want to tell you that when I was at the dealer, we built a lot of our own tickets, right? It wasn't like I, I knew what the labor was supposed to be. And I, I went out to the advisor and I said, um, this is in a rough condition. Like, I'm not going to be able to do this exhaust manifold in 3.8. I've done them in 3.8 before, whatever the number was. It's hard to remember now. We're going almost 20 years ago. When it was brand new. Yeah. I said, exactly. When I had to do it under warranty, I could do it within the time because it was brand new. It would come apart easy. When it's rotten and rusted and blah, blah, blah. So whatever. So it wasn't a situation I never got to build the estimate. But the way that would work for me is that I would go, he'd say, okay, I'll look after it. Well, when you flag your hour sheet the next day, he didn't look after it. Does does the consuming public up there understand the rust condition and that? No, no. It's they're getting better now, Mike, because there are shops that are having the backbone to be able to say, "I'm not." You and I talked about Ford manifold jobs, right? Our dealer, our Ford dealer, long time ago, when these were becoming real problem and they were out of warranty, they were starting to say, "I can't do it for the published time." My guy has to drill them out. My guy has to, you know, uh, weld a nut onto that end of that stud and get that out of there. That's going to take time. Do you want? It? They were doing the same thing when the spark plugs of the Triton were coming out and they were doing a tune-up. They would tell the customer flat out, "You want us to do a tune-up in this thing? Okay, here's where it could go. It could wind up being a set of cylinder heads on this." And the customer's like, "Well, I need that misfire fix. Like, you better whatever." So, yes, they're starting to get. But for everyone, and it, thank God it's the dealers that are, first of all, that had some of, the, in my area, that had the gumption to stand up and say, no, we need more because my, my techs just won't do the job. Because I'll tell you, a lot of guys at the flat rate in the dealerships where I work, you weren't going to pay me. It ain't getting in the shop. Yeah. You can go find another monkey to do it. And when, if you're, all monkeys are on the same boat, guess what? It ain't coming in the shop. Yeah, you create so, enough pain and they'll yeah. fix it. So... Right. Um, but there are still, for what you talk about, as many there are still other shops out there. They're like, "Oh man, I can do that in that time. I can I can wallop that," and they'll they'll hold the customer to that. So even if you could are super hustle, super efficient, 
did you make really the profit on it that you should have? No, because everyone else, if they'd have got the job, they'd have made more profit on it. So what are you doing by doing it for less profit? Well, maybe you're building a client base. Okay, I can respect that. But do you have people that want to work for you? Do you have... You're building a client base of unprofitable clients. Sure you are. You would have made more money saying no and doing something else. You said you would have made $15 if you'd stayed home that day when Mm -hmm. you were a kid. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with those customers. Exactly, right. So how do we get people to understand that then? Training? Coaching? When you say people, you mean people in our industry or the end user? People in our industry. We're not... The customer quotient to be able to fix, that's a whole other thing. Well, what you're doing is a big part of that. And what Lucas and David are doing is a big part of that. Um, There needs to be easily consumable... Uh, media conversations, videos, reels, whatever you want to call it, um, educating about the folly of how we've always done it. Mm-hmm. And we've always done it that way is not a reason, it's an excuse, right? Um, and so just spreading the word. Yeah. Getting the word out there, getting, uh, you know, I can, I can get on my soapbox and preach all day long, but I've never truly been in the trenches like the two of you. But Brian's got a lot more authority speaking to it because he's been on both ends of that spectrum, mm-hmm. right? Right, and, and and I support the tech. You know, that's yeah. where I came from. Yeah, you know, and I have my own shortcomings as a service advisor, um, and I'm aware of that. Mm-hmm. And we're going to work on that. Well, that's what you mentioned to me because you said you're the bottleneck within your own business. Hundred percent. That's a brave thing to say, man. Thank you for that. So it, it hurts to say it. <laughs> well, I d- and listen, I'm I'm not trying to say to signal single you out or make you feel I I'm I want to uplift everybody in this industry, right? I'm past the point of where I want to hate on owners and I want to be mad at owners and say that it's because of owners that I go without, right? Because at the end of the day, you know what? We're if, all in this together. And if I go without because of an owner, it's because I chose to stay with that owner. That's a good point. Right now, there is such a lucrative market that. If anybody, I heard, I just recorded last week and I said the same thing. If you're unhappy, get that toolbox, have a conversation with your person that is employing you, make them aware of the reality of what it is. And if you're not happy, put your money where your mouth is and go put yourself out there. There's a lot of them too. And Lucas and I talk about this. There's a lot of technicians out there that are overselling themselves, right? And their abilities. I am not, Brian Pollock is a superstar technician i don't care i put that guy in top 10 percent in the country i'm not that level right i'm not it's cool i'm good with it but what i am is i know what i'm capable of and i know what i'm not i know what i'm weak on and i know what i'm really strong at and i want i i'm always very upfront and honest with this is what i'm good at it's like you and i talked about you asked me to do a 10 diags on an ac job Boy, you better clear that schedule for the next month because it's going to take me ten. <laughs> it's going to take me a long time to do diag on AC. I am terrible at it. I don't have a lot of background on it. I don't have training on it. I can show you the electrical side of it, how it works. Can you imagine what a disaster it is to pinpoint AC leaks in a bus? Oh, you want to talk? <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> so here's 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 how it goes. We know that it's between this section and this section. Just replace everything. That's right. Take the battery out, put another bus under it, put the battery the back The bus in. was built around that section. <laughs> so that section is not coming out of there, and there's no public service information on how you maybe access that leak. God, I can't even imagine. Oh, my God. So that bus maybe now becomes a bus that we retire from the fleet. Or I made the analogy I was talking about last Holy night. Crap. If that sucker is only going to hold refrigerant in it for five days... <laughs> you only book four-day trips, and you refill it between trips. <laughs> That's really- <laughs> So right, you have the AC machine strapped to the back of the we, bus. <laughs> we buy we buy one thirty four by the pallet. Really, yeah. and I'm not trying. So please don't take this as we're taking a known system and and and, and we're doing our due diligence. Like yeah. if we can find a leak, we find a leak. But there are some places like where it is leaking, you can't get in there and with a UV light or a, a sniffer. Have you, you tried want- stop leak? <laughs> so they have this stuff. <laughs> I, I think I shared on my socials last week. There's a company called Red Tech that is huge up in Canada. Red Tech this is always because they're not selling. Sounds like communist. It, it could be. It's mm-hmm. probably made in China. But Red Tech is is a approved refrigerant blend that they can sell at. It would be up there. It'd be like an AutoZone. But down up in Canada, we don't have AutoZone. We got Canadian Tire. So you can sell Red Tech at Canadian Tire. Another store that we have is called Princess Auto, which is equivalent to like Harbor Freight. 
So they'll sell you cans of Red Tech. And they already now have an approved refrigerant you can buy in tiny little cans for twelve thirty four YF. Oh my so god. So people are buying these so it is not uncommon. What happens a lot, and it does to you guys too down here, is that you you know, your AC system is like when I hook up to this customer's car, I probably should really identify if there's something that's not virgin authentic mm-hmm. refrigerant in it because otherwise I'm contaminating my machine. There's a lot of that being done. There's a lot. So it's not a situation of we're not fixing the leaks that are in a bus. But it is one of those when we have a bus and it will not uh, maintain refrigerant level in it, we probably use that bus maybe more in the wintertime or we retire that bus. Because by then, by the time it does... You do what you got to do. By the time it gets to that level, it might already have a million and something on it. Right? So it's getting to be where it's not reliable. And my boss is very good. He tracks the expenses, expense reports on each bus per year, what it's going to take, what, it, what how many downtime days it was, what, how many times we had to reschedule around it because it was broke down, that kind of stuff. And then he will sell that bus off. So, it, it But it's one of them things where, you know, it... it so it, there's, some, there's some poor dude who's servicing the second owner buses from your company. Yeah. When you all have made the, done the calculus to figure out yeah. that it's no longer worth yeah. taking care of this thing. They, they tend to be bought by people that want to start their own busing company. And what they are is they're okay with their customer that's going to take Walking? A, uh, no. <laughs> Listen, we keep, we keep, they'll keep running. But you're going to take a bus trip, say, from Montreal, and you're going to see go all the way to Toronto. That's a eight-hour drive. You're going to make that with no AC in the bus. And he's going to oh. apologize every time, and he's going to say, I'm sorry, it was working yesterday. I don't know what happened. The reality is he knows what happened. It won't hold refrigerant. But the reality is he'll do that route. He'll undercut us on a price, on a bid, and and just yeah. you know make excuses for for the reduced value, reduced service that he provides, right? And there are, it's just like we go back to it. There is customers for that, right? Yeah. That I can take that bus tour for 60 bucks. That's better than paying a hundred. The difference might be is in a hundred dollar bus tour, you're riding around with the air conditioning on in the bus versus the six. Or you're still riding around as opposed right. to walking. Yes. So none of them walk. As soon as the bus is is down, we're normally sending a rescue bus to it, and we put them on another bus, and we get the tour continued, and then we either limp that bus back home where we fix it, or it gets fixed where it is to get us back home. It's a very interesting. Do y'all run? Uh... I assume that you you're running tours year round. Yeah. And and man, I can't imagine roadside service on a on a tour bus in February in Canada. It sucks. Anything roadside in Canada sucks, first of all. But on a bus it's even harder because it, like buses are a very specific thing where it's like for instance ours are all Prevo. We buy Prevo just Prevo for a very reason, for good reason, because we're, we're familiar with how Prevo does things. We're familiar with the bus. If somebody calls us and says, I have XYZ brand bus, can you look at it because you refer buses? We say no. We are responsible first and foremost for our own fleet. We're familiar with that brand. We don't want to go down a wormhole of trying to fix your different bus that we're not familiar with because A, we probably can't get parts for it, or B, we wouldn't even have a clue how to approach... Uh, even accessing the service information for that. So it's it's very like high-end cars, right? It's very similar to that where a lot of people, if you've got a high-end car and you're trying to take it to an independent shop, unless they've got the OE service information and the OE scan tool, we have OE factory scan tool for the bus, for the Prevo systems. All the systems, because it's a Volvo Pentastar engine in it, or not Pentastar, Volvo, um, I'm thinking Chrysler there for again for a second. So it has all that in it. We have. You don't software. have to call yourself out. I had no idea what you yeah. were talking about. We have. We don't have to to you know jump around and try and interpret is that really right or not. You know we have the Volvo software that's actually working on that bus. The the rest of the systems in the bus I can make a. I don't have to because I don't work on these buses. We make a phone call and we talk to one of the engineers that actually is responsible for those buses being built every day in Quebec City and Canada, and they walk us through what to look for, how to how to service it, and all that kind of stuff. Plus, we send our guys to training. How did you find yourself going from the Ford dealer to uh, fleet service bus specialty place? So it's not actually Ford dealer. I never worked in Ford dealer. I've worked at Chrysler dealer. I've worked at Nissan dealer. I've worked at Hyundai dealer. Ford, um, if I'd have brought one home when I was a kid, 16 years old, my father was still alive, he'd have kicked my tail right out. I'd have been living somewhere else. He hated them. As a collision guy, he felt that they were always like, they rusted too fast. They were trash. So I'm not a Ford guy. So 
I've bounced around all the time between I'll go where somebody treats me good. So I've worked the dealerships. I've worked the independent shops, right? I've worked independents oftentimes between dealer jobs because my the way I am doesn't always suit a dealer, right? Because if I take four hours to do the job because it took four hours to do the job, I'm getting paid four hours to do the job. If you want to come up with some BS like that exhaust manifold job about why, oh, well, it took you eight, I can only get four. What if it took you four hours? It's normally a two-hour job, but you fucked it up with a stupid mistake. Well, define stupid. Like you got to eat that. As a tech, if you screw it up and it takes you more time than it should, that's on you. Well, I'm trying to think how I can think of a scenario because, I mean, like, so if, say, I'm up you, there with a torch you, you, cutting a bolt do, off. You're doing an oil leak and you pinch the gasket, putting it back together. You didn't realize it until you were done with the job. Right, right. You go drive and it's puking oil everywhere right. and you got to do the job over again. I don't, when I was flat rate, I did not expect to get paid to do that over again. Do you expect to get paid to do it over again in a normal scenario now? Uh, so this will sound bad. The only reason I would expect is because I've seen somebody make a mistake and still get paid for their mistakes. So that's a funny precedence, right? When we talk about that. It is. Because, it's delicate, right? Because right? people yeah. make mistakes. Yeah. And so like I've had technicians come to me after making a mistake and say, you know, hey, boss, I'm sorry I screwed that up. I'll pay for it. I'm mm-hmm. like, dude, no. That's crazy. You don't need to come out of pocket. But is it reasonable to say, hey, boss, this was not just like a fluke, weird situation. This was a stupid mistake on yeah. my part. I should do the job again and make it right and not expect to be paid twice to do it because I screwed it up the first time. Mm-hmm. Now, if if there needs to be two sets of parts that go through that, well, then the company needs to eat the parts, yeah. right? Yeah. So what's the right answer there? I'm, I'm genuinely, cur- genuinely curious. So somebody asked that in the Changing Industry podcast the other day, and it kind of came up, and I said, here's an example I gave. Say I diagnose a coil as bad, right, on a Ford. Let's use Ford because let's, let's be real. They, yeah. they use a lot of coils, <laughs> yeah. right? And um, say I put the coil in it, and then it comes back in 30 days later, and the connector's hanging out of it. And nobody probably touched it. Nobody unplugged it. Nobody, it's never worked somewhere else. And the terminal tension is crap. Maybe the plastics broke off and I, and I just jammed it back in, right? I do not expect to get paid to diagnose that again. That I, to di- Why pay the guy to diagnose that he it was his screw up? And then, okay, so it needs a connector. I'll probably go out there and just put that connector on and I would have expected that I'm not expecting to get paid for that. I would have probably done that on my lunch if I was... Yeah, but that's an easy 10-minute... <coughs> Swap it out, right? Well, what maybe. It, what if it's the one under the intake? Maybe I had the intake off and, you know. Well, so then are you going to do that one? It should have got all of it. If it's under the intake, it gets all the coils under the intake. And if you put a questionable connector back on, that's still your yeah. fault. Yeah. I mean, you risk too much. Yeah. You got to fix it. But then. we had an interesting conversation where I said, but what if the situation, and this is where it sometimes it gets used against the tech, is the tech may go out there and say, Listen, I've had one of these where these connectors sometimes, like, the, who's the, what's the ones at the Toyota that every time you unplug the coil, break. the Toyota breaks? Yes, all of so them. So if you're going to quote that job now, here's how I'm going to quote it. I'm going to quote it just like you said, six coils, six connectors I'm going to install. And mm-hmm. then somebody can say, but we as owners sometimes, not me as owners, but owners can say to the tech, what are you trying to do? Blow my estimate out of the water? You're trying to do this for, you know, twice as much as the, my competition? No, we're not trying to do it for twice as much your competition. We're not that involved in what the prices is. We're trying to avoid the comeback. And that's what makes a tech sometimes seem like they want to install every part in the engine when they're doing an oil leak or something like that. Because if I have to donate the time to redo it on a, on a judgment, I don't want that, right? I don't want to work for free. So I want maybe sometimes it's like when we see guys and it's like, I want every bolt and I want every gasket and la, 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 la. And people go, Oh my God, man! You're blowing this this estimate out of the water. Well, so it's, it's communication and managing expectations, right? I mean, how many times have you heard, um, you know, Lucas or David or any of the you know popular talking heads in our industry mm-hmm. say over promise under deliver, right? Yes. It. I mean, go back to the Triton yeah. uh, spark plugs, right? Yeah. You got good at those, and you got to where they didn't break very often because mm-hmm. you knew how to get them out, right? But it was still a possibility. So. It's your job, or it's someone in your company's job to explain, Mr. Customer, there's a known problem with these, and this tends to happen. Yeah. And if this happens, 
here's the additional cost. Yep. And so I'm going to provide an estimate to you that is the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. If this happens on all eight holes, here's what we're potentially looking at. Or maybe we're looking at heads, right? Yep. I don't expect that will happen. We're really good at this. Yep. But it happens sometimes. And then you're you're communicating the worst case scenario and then you get to be the hero yes when you come back to them and one had to be one, tapped 100 percent. that always drove me nuts because in the dealer you start to learn the product really well and you've seen the worst case scenario happen and then you got an advisor out there that never wants to make the customer aware of where this could go okay it's mr advisor, advisor it is a lazy advisor and uh, where's your head been up your butt for the last six months you've seen this go sideways three times you should be making your customer aware that okay, we're going to do some exhaust manifolds on your on your six point eight F three fifty V ten. We have not had one of them in a, quite a while that they could take them off without having to get the welder out and get onto the bolt and get the. the it's going to take more time. You got an advisor that rolls in all of a sudden. He decides he's not going to make his customer aware ahead of time, and now he has to hold me up. We we talked about hoists earlier, right, and bays, and how if I'm going to work flat rate, I want at least two. And I was that kind of guy where if I inspected it and you didn't have approval, I ain't putting it back together to put it back outside to take it back apart. It's going to sit there until you tell me that it's right. done because I've got my estimate time, and if the job doesn't sell, i got to get it back together, ready to go out as I found it within that estimate time, no exceptions. Because otherwise, taking it apart twice. I will not do that for the same amount of money. I refuse. Because right. to me, I'm doing the same job twice. I'm getting it back to the same point that it was. If you're only going to pay me for the one time, that's theft. I'm sorry. That's how I see it. I'm giving you twice the labor for half the money. I, I'm not good with it. You can tell me, well, but you're going to get it apart and you're going to do X, Y, and Z on it. Cool. I already had it apart, though. Right? It's the same as when we do brake inspection in this industry and we say, okay, we're going to do a brake inspection and then we're going to put it back together and the customer's going to come back to the brakes. Oh, when you do the brake job now, though, your inspection time that you spent last week, say an hour on a brake inspection, we're going to take that off the top because you already inspected it. Cool. I understand the management, the man, the marketing aspect of that, but that's lazy service advisor. I got to do the job over again because I got to take it back apart exactly. to get to where I can install the. You didn't have it pre-sold. I used to. You've heard me all argue about this. You work at a dealership, or you say you work on a on a fleet of the same type of things. Customers got a brake complaint. You all should have it memorized in your head. Caravan brake pads, calipers, rotors cost seven hundred and seventy nine dollars and eighty four cents plus applicable taxes. It's going to be nine hundred and sixty two dollars, ma'am. Can I get that started for you right away? Yes or no? You should not have to say before it's even in here. Let's take it apart. Let's look at it. Let's call. You should have that customer primed that this is what it could be, and this is sometimes an unpopular opinion. You should have that customer primed that it's going to be maybe this. This is what it costs. If it's that's what it is, do I have your authorization to do that? Yes or no? That streamlines the whole process, right? It's not a blank check to say, go ahead and definitely spend $960, right? If she's only got a rock in the, between the rotor and the backing plate, and we go over there and we take the rock out, and the driving around and the pads are still thick enough and the rotors are still fine, it doesn't make any noise. That's not to say that she's where everybody out there is immediately going to slap a CPR job on that cal calipers, pads, and rotors and do it for $969. But why tie that tech up and that bay up that could be making you money? Well, you have to go through the procedure of calling that customer, making the pitch, which you've already made the pitch a hundred times in your career at that particular place. Explain to me as owners, what's the logical of not doing it like that? Pre-selling work is great when you have uh, clients that already know, trust, and like you. Mm -hmm. Or at a yeah. dealer. You know, everything that I work on is different. Right. You know, I just can't pull that number yeah. out of my head. Right. So, uh, yeah, I mean. Does it need a brake fluid service? In, you know, I'm already going to be calling them back because it needs a belt and radiator hoses uh -huh. and struts. Right. Why well, make two calls? You yeah. know, I, I still feel like I can just sell all of it with one call. Mm -hmm. And and I don't think it takes long. It, it, you know, our, our shop management systems are so good. I mean, I'm building 90% of the tickets in 15 minutes or less, probably less than 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't mind because by the time they turn in that ticket, I'm sending off the DVI. Mm -hmm. You know, by the time they're calling, even if they get it and call me back, I'm 80% done right. or all the way done and, and ready yeah. for the sales call. That I, I don't think I need to sell that would be my thoughts on it. I think, but I, I get what you're saying, yeah. but I also turn it around really quick. 
I didn't mean to cut you off. No, it's okay. I, I have uh, I have mixed feelings about, you know, pull it in, do the DVI, put it back together and back it out. Unless you get an answer immediately, put it back together and back it out. And I understand that there's lost time having to set the lift twice and pull the wheels twice and, and that kind of thing. But we've built systems and processes into the way that we operate to account for that lost time mm-hmm. and to make sure that it's still profitable for the team members. Um, you know, <laughs> I remember when you started going to training, um, you were all over us as advisors, Brian. Uh, I don't remember whose class it was, but somebody broke down the value of your time per minute as a technician producing. And at that point, and this is early 2000s, it was something like, you know, 18 or $20 a minute or something like that. But- we spoke about it, so we had mm-hmm. two lifts. So morning would start. Let's say I had nothing left over from the day before. I'd pull one in, check it out. Yeah. Pull another one in, check it out. Yeah. If I hadn't heard about that one, it's going out the door, and then the next one. And mm-hmm. I didn't mind having the GS guys push stuff in late in the day. Yeah. But, no, I was going to be busy the whole time. You yeah. know, I, I, flat rate, I like being paid flat rate. I would count my steps doing a job to make sure I was doing it the most efficient way I could. Count Just your steps, meaning like literally so count my steps. <laughs> I bought an alignment machine. Uh-huh. I had never done an alignment before. So I learned how to do it. And then I'm subconsciously counting my steps so I can do it in the most efficient way possible. Right. No extra steps. Yeah. Because uh, you see guys running around. Yep. They're not efficient. Yeah. They're just wasting time i'd rather walk at a reasonable pace and take no extra steps because i know i'm doing it in the most efficient way possible well just having the understanding that you know okay this is the 10th time i've done one of these jobs i know every tool i'm going to need for that job i'm Mm going to take them all out and put them in the cart and the cart's coming with me to the job and i never go back to the toolbox until i'm putting the tools back in the in the box yeah right because i know what i need so i'm not and and we all have guys or have seen guys that are back and forth to the box, back and forth to the box, back and forth to the I'm box. I'm guilty of that. Oh, right man, I, like a timing belt on a Honda Odyssey, I could open the toolbox, put everything in the car, yeah. roll yeah. it over, uh-huh. finish the job, back it out. See, yeah. I was like that way with steering racks on caravans. Yeah. I had everything right on top of the cart, and I could do it. Like, I could I could do them in 45 minutes. I and, they, and they paid six hours. Like, they were awesome. And it's just because I they leaked so much under warranty, you were like, What's it paying a worry for hours? Hell yeah. You know, so like, Just give me six of those a day. And like you didn't even care if the customer complained about it. You're doing your due diligence. You're looking at that going, oh, that steering rack's starting to leak. But I better go out there. And like our advisors, this was before back in the day where they weren't necessarily watching so much the OEs where it's like if the customer didn't have a complaint, you don't do the repair. That's how the dealers really got hung is because, which I had both sides because it was like, I'll, I'll give you an example. Neon head gaskets used to leak oil really bad. Really bad. First shed in neons. Well, that single cam one, those guys would write them up all day because they were easy to do. That same head gasket on a on a two four, the twin cam, which sucks way more to time and do, they didn't write them up nearly as much. It's the same bleeding gasket in there, right? It's the same leak. It's the same failure. So, so, so I got a really good joke about Dodges, but you might have to edit it out. I'm not sure if it's clean enough. Lucas will get offended. He said he loves the Dodge. So. I'd rather have a sister in a whorehouse than a brother in a Dodge. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I heard that years ago. That makes me think of that. That makes me think of that Borat line. <laughs> My not, this is, there's number three no. prostitute. <laughs> so when when the dealers were not cracking down so much on what actually was being, if a customer didn't have to complain about it, you didn't sell it, right? They had to be, and I've seen dealers where they're under restriction which means they're doing so much warranty work that if the customer didn't have a complaint about it, they didn't want you to write it up. Because why? So because if you're wait, I'm on the forums and I'm hearing about ESOs. That's what is that? ESO was the abbreviation. Evil I, shop owner. I saw right? that in IATN years ago. Uh, so what is that? Owner. An evil dealership? ED. Oh. ED is that something different, right? Yeah, ED is electri- erectile dysfunction. Both are problems. And s- yeah. Both the problems within a lot of dealer owners. I'll There's tell you that medicine right now. for one of those. Yeah, the other one, <laughs> the medicine's the blue pill and money. So anyway, because you've seen some dealer owners that they're how'd you get that? Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so under restriction meant that they were doing way more warranty. And this is how it was explained to me. 
the guy would come down, your your district manager, and he would say, you're doing way more tie rods on caravans than any of these than other the dealers average. in your area. Why are you doing so many? Well, there's two th- sides of thinking of that. One, I told you about how we would do it, is if we had one that was loose and the other one was really loose, we did them both. And then I was telling you how, because of how our shop was set up, the customer, if it had around 30,000 kilometers on the customer paid for the alignment. Right, so any tech in the shop would do the two tie rods. It would wheel over to that one shop, one tech's bay that only had the alignment rack in it. He did all the alignments in the shop. He would do that alignment. That was how our shop was set up. Other shops, maybe, they did that one tie rod. They did not charge for the alignment. And then if the customer came back in two months and the next tie rod was loose, they just did it and put the warranty claim through again. Now, you can look at that and go, that shop that's not charging for alignments is missing out on an opportunity to make some money. The other way you can look at that is if I charge the customer for the alignment and I do one tie rod and the other one's got a little bit of play but it's the allowable amount and in a month time they hit a pothole and they come back in and it's past the allowable amount. What's do, the allow, allowable amount so I was told in the one, dealer? It had, to have over two, it had to have over an eighth of play before they wanted it changed. Thanks for changing that to uh, American for us. Yeah, I don't. I don't do the metric thing because I was I was raised on on standard, but so you see my point. Whereas if I was to charge the customer the alignment, and then I was to do just one tie rod, under warranty, and then that next tie rod failed, and I had to ding the customer for another alignment, that customer's mad at me, right? And they're gonna say, "Well, if they're such a known thing, why didn't you just change yeah. both of them while I was just here?" And you, good luck trying to explain to the customer that hey. Your OE that built this band, that you love this band, you think this band is great. If I had to tell you about how often I hate dealing with the OEs on what they want to pay for warranty, and you know, because everybody thinks that you, like you get a hundred percent payback on your warranty claims, that's a myth. There ain't anyone running with hundred percent. They're not even close. You, every claim that you make, you now get paid. It doesn't work that way. You have to be absolutely meticulous in your paperwork and your process and everything else before they want to pay because it's just a numbers game to them, right? It doesn't matter whether you fix the car. If you don't have, say the one number in the VIN is wrong, they're not going to pay that claim. So this is the the, the side that people have never if worked that, in a dealer. If that claim is not filed appropriately and the dealership does not get paid for that claim, do you not get paid for I your hours? I still get paid. Okay. Good. Yeah. I've never now I've heard of other techs that have been in dealerships where stuff didn't get closed off, where stuff didn't get paid, and they come to the tech and go, I know you did the repair and I know the car's fixed, but they're not paying us for that repair, or they're only paying that's all I can pay you. <laughs> if that tech <laughs> accepted that as an answer, they're part of the problem. They're then. part of the problem because my head's gonna explode just hearing that. But see I, I just couldn't is, imagine. This is you and I talking. If you've never been in it, you don't know it. You don't know it. You just think it's like, okay, he does the job, he gets paid. That's how in one section of the real world it works. The other section is, and I look at it real like this. Most dealership owners, they're millionaires. So if you try to tell me you can't afford to pay me 50 bucks for two hours of labor, you're full of it. And I'll never swallow that, ever. I won't believe you. Now, I don't want to see it be taken advantage of. Don't tell me that there isn't the money there. Give me any other reason. Think of something way more creative than just saying the money's not there. When I worked for your dad, Mike, uh, I pushed to have us all review each other, where the techs reviewed the service advisors and the parts person, you know, everybody back and forth. And one of the complaints that I got from one of the service advisors was that I worried too much about getting paid correctly. (laughs) (laughs) And, 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 And... I think your dad did that too. Somebody said you worry about too much about getting paid correctly. It's like, look, I'm here to make a living. Yeah. I just happen to do it fixing cars. Right. That is the A number one reason I'm here. I want every dollar coming to me. My so, number one priority when I go to work is that you pay me correctly. A hundred percent. One of the yeah. things that took me years to get over after I left dad's operation and went to Carfix. Um, so, I think everyone that wasn't a tire tech at Dad's operation was pure flat rate. I think no. So what we made is is we all made seven dollars an hour to be in the building, and then we made flat rate above and beyond to, that. And, and there then, were tiers that you could get more per hour yes, if you turn. And, and that's more. what I told you earlier is that at 120 hours that was the highest tier. Right. So over I, two I, weeks. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So. I, 
you know, I just made sure I did that. Uh huh. So, but there was a, a very difference. heavily weighted performance based pay plan for uh, almost uh, everybody. It, I can tell you, I think it went up like a um, dollar and a half at 90, and then it went up like 75 cents for every hour, each 10 hours above that. Yeah. So, so, I can I tell mean, you the you last time that, that Nissan coached me, coached, poached me into joining their team was to tell me about a performance bonus that once I hit 45, I wasn't going to be making 28. I was going to be making 30 an hour flat rate hour. And I went, oh, 45, that should be easy. No problem. I made it once in a year and a half. Two, really? Three years of work. Was that a because, car count issue? Was it an advisor issue? That is Or a, the work they were feeding you issue. That's an issue of like, okay, we got a whole lot of guys in this shop. We don't have necessarily enough work in there, but we keep these guys on because yeah. if, if I... They flood the, flood the building with technicians and yeah. nobody ever gets bonus because it's cost a, of labor it's, load. That, That's that was, evil shop owner. Yeah, that they, was not my experience. Dangling that, carrot, there, right? There was yeah. just as, as much work as I could possibly do so you're like that dumb mule that just keeps whipped every day that's got the carrot hanging out in front of him it's like i'm gonna catch yeah. that carrot one day but he was a dumb mule he was a, a very well earning mule right? <laughs> yeah, he right. was but he also knew like they knew they're tracking that yeah so it's like you've had a really good first four days day five you're gonna get handed crap all right it's cheaper to hire another mechanic than to pay everybody the bonus Oh yeah, so you're talking about it, Nissan? Yeah, yeah. So that was one of my one of my big uh, pitches to technicians early on when I was uh, trying to compete with dealership techs before mm-hmm. I paid on their level or before mm-hmm. I had benefits on their level was, look, they're you know how many bays they got? They got 25 bays. They're going to put 20 technicians in 25 bays, and you're going to get one and a half to two cars a day, and you'll never hit bonus. Right. I'm gonna have you're gonna have two bays. And you're going to be one of four techs. Yep. And you'll always have more cars than you can deal with. But you understand my reluctance now to even talk about and engage in the conversation of a bonus plan or an incentivize that's, uh, you know, whatever you want to call yeah. it, uh, yeah. hourly with You've a You've been burned plan. so many times well, uh, that you don't trust it. I understand. So one, uh, let's say you have a comeback. Yep. Do you give it back to the tech that did the job or to a different tech? So comebacks for me, this is a, this, I love this conversation, was a very lucrative thing because... And oftentimes it was a very avoidable thing. And what tended to happen is they dispatched it because of a time constraint, scheduling problem or whatever, to somebody that maybe wasn't as proficient at the diag. And the car would come back. Car's misfiring, right? Gets all new plugs and a fuel system service. On a v- Say V8 Hemi comes in, it's misfiring, right? It, it gets, it's got... Fit. So they load the parts cannon and they don't ever diagnose Well, so it. that's not necessarily a load the parts cannon because, like, the Hemi's, the first-gen Hemi... Um, was known for like they were still putting copper core spark plugs mm-hmm. in it so fifty thousand k on a hemi kilometers it needed plugs twenty thousand miles ago it was getting to where that plug was so you thousand k is like 75 miles right yeah. no oh, fifty thousand oh, yeah. k is like thirty five thousand. So, yeah so <laughs> it would it, it would get it would get a fuel system cleaning that was two hours right so that's you take the throttle bay off you clean it you run into some injector cleaner through the rail and it would get all six all eight par- spark plugs and you would clear your adapters and you kick it out the door that truck would come back next week, and it'd be the same thing, misfiring all again. And I'd get it. Well, the EGR is hanging open, right? Only maybe this time it had an EGR fault, but maybe it didn't. But I still caught that the EGR was open, and that's why the truck misfired. So the first guy just did the overdue maintenance without actually finding the source of the well, problem. That's a necessary first step, though. So I don't hate that they did that to that, start with. That almost as long as yeah, the service a, advisor said, "Hey." There might be more problems. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see when it would come so back. So many of our problems in our industry as a whole is failure of communication. It's right. Miss Jones, you know, you're know, you 20,000 kilometers overdue for these maintenance services, and we can't possibly figure out what's uh-huh. bad until we replace what we know is, is overdue. Right. So we have to start here, and then we'll reset the system, and we'll see what else is going on. Yeah. If you had a quality advisor yeah. who was confident in what they were presenting, then you, you overcome a lot of those objections. Those are perceived comebacks. Mm-hmm. And the perception is created by a poor quality advisor communication. Yeah. But see, I was always jilted because I would have like I would have caught that the EGR was bad and I would have done the EGR, plus I'd have sold the fuel system cleaning right. and the tune up. So I would have taken that one hour EGR job and I would have made it into another a five hour job. From my two two hours for a tune up and two hours for my fuel like system it. cleaning. Right? Whereas now that guy got four hours. And I got one. And you fixed the problem. And I fixed the problem. Right. So that's why comebacks to me, 
Should they always go back to the tech that that did the car? Sure, provided that they can actually fix the car. You know. So, so let's say it's a legit comeback where the tech screwed something right. up. Yeah. And I'm the one that worked on it to start with, mm-hmm. and then you get it coming back. Mm-hmm. So you fix it. It's my screw up. What happens? So, because I, I, real quick, I know one thing that would happen when I worked for James is that if I screwed something up and someone else had to fix it, they would charge that flat flag time, flat rate, back from me. They dock you. Yeah. Yeah, that's illegal, is it not? Well, uh, so I don't I, think it's I don't think it's illegal here. So, mm-hmm. so, so I thought but, it was a great plan because right. it held everybody accountable because it, it wasn't a problem for me. I don't have quality issues. Right. I think that speaks to the culture that Dad had in his business, though. Because yeah. I can tell you, there was a culture of accountability, and like it, it happened so rarely uh, that it wasn't a situation where people were getting screwed over. I, I don't agree. Think. Hundred percent agree. I, with I can tell on you that. the scenario that I saw happen is that we had a, we had some guys that could really turn and burn, really generate some hours, even on diag, you know diagnostics check engine light they could really turn some hours was their accuracy 100 percent? no not even close not even close but they were so busy that you just couldn't give them their comebacks now if you tried to back flag them here's my thing with back flagging if i'm not available how do i know you're not full of it when you tell me that you had to do x oh, y I, and z to I fix agree. the drive yeah, that's why so, i wanted to bring it up that's yeah, a really good point it's, it's, you, you got to trust the it's other it's a dude. slippery slope yeah trust the other dude and when you work in a dealership where you're all like you're all like dogs on chains and there's like you're in, pulling up to the scratch ring and you're like you're trying to get him to get him to get him to get him to fight one another cuz that's that's how i don't care what they talk about in other podcasts about creating cultures within a dealership that's what you want you want everybody hustling you want all the motivation you want hungry hungry right well if i don't already like that guy because i feel like he's fed if you give me one of his if he takes one of my comebacks because say i'm on vacation and you try to back flag me you're gonna watch my toolbox roll out the driveway because you're not that's theft you didn't give me the opportunity to make it right you didn't get to have the conversation with me about how do i make it right i don't trust that guy that he even did anything because i would see it he would work on it he would get paid that tech would get back flagged some bitch there's the same car next month for the same intermittent problem or the same damn thing who are we back flagging now boys <laughs> that's right? a really good point all right i, I want to can i go like a uh, uh, full change you said it triggered something in my head you said uh i already don't like that guy because i feel like he's being fed right i'm in the actively in the process of interviewing a husband and wife couple Okay. 25 years of experience, one as an advisor and one as a technician. Very high-level technician, um, all the certifications. Everything indicates that he is what he what he says he is. Sure. Um, wife has the performance reports to dictate that she is what she says she is. Yep. Part of the deal is they want to work together. I'd never do it. Right? Yeah. So <laughs> here, here's the – like. They've got a history of working together. They got a history of good numbers together, a good performance together. Was it in a business that failed? No. It's, so they are. Uh, they're currently wanting to leave a chain store that they both went to because a headhunter got them and promised them the world and didn't mm. deliver. Right. Right. Um, but here's the fear: How do I keep the other technicians? Because in the shop that they would be plugged into, she would be in charge of dispatch. Yeah. How do you keep the other technicians from feeling like all the best work is being fed to her husband? Well, Mike, like, let me tell you, if you can put this together and you can make it work, and if anybody can, it's going to be you. <laughs> but whatever it is that you can do then and you can sell to me, sell to everyone else because I have never seen it work yet, and I'll tell you why. I've worked in dealerships where if you started to see a tech date and advisor, that was highly frowned upon because... And it's even worse when it's a husband and wife. They're going home to the same thing, right? If he's struggling, she's struggling. If she's struggling, he's struggling. Now, you can look at that if together. They're fighting. Oh, yeah. but I'm, I'm thinking just from the production standpoint. Mm-hmm. She's going to have all the prime candidates prime for him. It's, it's just I don't care how yes, you... It's human nature, right? Exactly. Because she's getting paid twice, once for selling the job and once for her husband doing the job. Exactly. So... To me, what you're describing here, I can tell you I have never seen it work in my experience yet. So I would put a big tread cautiously, my friend Mike, because 
I don't see that working well because you're going to, no matter what your culture is within your shop, if he is the superstar that he says he is, and even if it's all 100% on the board and legit, your techs, otherwise, if they start to see, maybe they, the tech that was number one is now number two, it's the first thing he's going to say. So, it, and I'm not trying to say that it can't work. But I think they're better. There's a lot of ways for it to fail. I, yeah. If I had two stores, I'd put one in each store. I don't believe that. Well, that so that's part of the conversation. I don't have a store actively that needs both of them in one location. And they're like, well, that's great as long as we can work towards that as an, as an end goal. I have talked to so many shop owners, technicians that talk about when there was an inner dynamic within the people working, how it killed the culture within the shop. Talking about a, a husband technician, wife service advisor. Right. It, it, it kind of be like having two brothers and you fire one. How long is the other one going to work for you? Well, it's, just, it's a super common scenario in independent aftermarket shops, right, is that the husband's the primary technician and the wife's running the books in the, in the, in the office. Mm-hmm. But that's different because they're the boss. Right. Um, so. They fail together or they succeed together. Yeah. When, when I talk about fed, that is the first word that a lot of people say is they're, he's fed the good work. Mm-hmm. Now, that's often times why they're fed the good work is because they can get the work done. Mm-hmm. And that's an unpopular thing to say. I was fed a lot of work, but why? Because I could get it done. That's not it, the same. Because the advisors You were fed the comp- work you were good at. You yes. were fed the diag stuff, drivability, yeah. that kind of stuff. I would go to them and say, it don't matter if you've got... I would If, if I walked in at 8 o'clock in the morning and the first job you handed me was four tires, it didn't matter if I could do those four tires in 60 minutes. I would say to them, have you got a drivability job to do? Why don't you give me that? Well, why don't you want to get this banged up real quick? Well, because if you give it to that guy, next week I'm still probably going to be fixing it. So I might as well have it now. And we avoid the comeback discussion, right? Let's try to eliminate the comeback. See, I had a great conversation just the other day with um, Chris Craig from TikTok. You guys don't know him, but he's great. His episode's going to drop. And we talk about how important dispatch is in a successful shop. Don't matter, dealership, independent, whatever. It is the most... It is the most poorly compensated and unsung hero of just about any is the person that's doing the dispatching because that is how you get your flow going so well. I've worked with so many countless good ones that knew, okay, like I'm going to, they, if, if I got handed somebody's comeback, I didn't have to chew her butt because it was like, I already knew that she knew that I wasn't supposed to have that car and somebody above her had said, listen, we need this fixed. He's got the best odds of being able to fix it. Just give communicate. It, give it to him. And, and, and If they come to you and say, here's why you're yeah. getting it. This is why we need you to take one for the team here. Well, it works good. We were on an automated dispatch system, which works on labor ops on a code. 01 is general. 01 is, can be anything. So here's how it goes, right? You might have a ticket comes in and it's like, check engine light diagnostic on. Say check engine light diag labor op is, point two, is zero 02. Well, you would start that zero one, miscellaneous maintenance, and then you put your two. Your second line would be O two, your drivability. That would flag to anybody in the shop, and they would pick it up. That meant that that customer had to is waiting, or that meant that we just need somebody to look at this car and get it done. So then that car may he may, oh, I'm doing a tune up on it, and then it would leave, and then it would come back, and and then we then we treated it like okay, we should probably dispatch it to the proper person. That's what you want to avoid in all scenarios from a shop is dispatching it to the wrong person, right? Right. I feel like most of the time the independents have it better because they know more about what where your strong suits are, where your strong suits are. It's a smaller group of guys in a lot of cases too. And I'll tell you right, this is the other scenario I've seen in dealerships a lot of time. There's such a high turnover rate. They never get to learn where they're really strong. Now, the other thing is if they're all on the standardized same, this is the other argument they make for guys not being specialized. Well, you all took the same training. You should all be able to do that job. You can train to your blue in the face. Some people just have an aptitude for being able to yank a transmission or an engine out of a truck. And some people have an aptitude for being able to look at a bunch of PIDs on a scan tool and diagnose what's going on with that car. I don't care that that guy over there has been doing transmissions for 25 years. If you start to give him diagnostic as to why that transmission's in limp, you and I talked about this this afternoon, he's going to struggle with that. Yeah. I could no more tell you, like I said, you could tell me there's a whole bunch of elves inside of an automatic t- transmission and they're turning levers and I believe you. 
because I I'm not I haven't taken one <laughs> apart in over 25 years. I know how they work, but I'm not going to be. A t- but if that sucker's in limp, I'm your guy that's going to be able to get it out of limp, or to prove to you that it's not. It's 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 in limp because of a mechanical issue inside. All the electronically circuitry logic is all perfect. It's got a fault in the inside. That's why it's in limp. I'm your guy for that. So when I would see transmission guys get into the diag on why the damn thing was in limp, we saw more than once. We saw a four-speed transmission go into it in the caravan, and the thing still be in limp. This guy'd go over and he'd change a relay or he'd fix a fuse on a splice, and that sucker wouldn't be in limp anymore. Did it need a tranny? Uh, yeah, it's tough. It probably didn't because it it's probably really worked tough. one day and then the next day it's in limp. What did it really need? You never really know. Okay, but their thing was they made six grand on doing the transmission. If I have, if I got to pay Jeff two hundred bucks to fix the splice, we just eat that. That's dirty. It is, but it's it hard is to profitable. Pay, it's hard to pay you flat rate when you're that guy too, right? So you understand my, and I didn't want this to be all about flat rate. I'm just, you know, this is this is a beautiful opportunity for me to sit down with two really good shop owners, and you hear my perspectives from the Jada mechanic, and I hear yours because, at the end of the day, if you're starting to hire people now and you get see guys that are coming out of the dealer and they're starting to tell you, listen, I've had enough of the dealer, I've had enough of, this is where it comes from, and it's not a new thing, it's just there's more and more of us, and I don't, I'm not responsible for it. Don't say before Jeff Compton got online and started telling everybody to stand up for themselves. <laughs> You know, I'm sure there's a bunch of... De- uh, you're never going to see me on some of the podcasts where it's a bunch of dealer fixed op guys. Cause I'm Are not- there dealer fixed op podcasts? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You I, just, I just don't know. Them. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I don't know if I'm public enemy number one. I'm working towards that. That's All I listen my- to is David and Lucas yeah. and Carm and his crew. Yeah. yeah. So. so I'm working towards that. Um, Beyond the Ranch, Jay Ginnanen, he, he does a lot of dealer owners. Um, fixed op people. Joshua Taylor does a lot of fixed op guys. Do they... Sp- I, I feel like those guys, they're at operating at such a high revenue level and there's so much money at stake that I feel like it would be hard to get them to truly open up and share honestly without being heavily filtered. Oh, I don't, I don't expect to get the 100%. Because I feel like you're just going to get the, the, the heavily polished Edited. politician version yeah. of their opinion. And I'm cool with that. If they ever approach me and they want to discuss about what techs want as culture we can sit down and you can and i'll school you yeah, what i but think but that's going to be you talking to them but they're not they're well, just they're just going to give you lip service right? you know I, I i'm a uh, shop owner now but i, mm-hmm. I feel like i'm 100 percent behind you because yeah. that's the that's the pain i grew up with so I, and you know, this I is try to put myself and, and in their shoes lucas and i've had this conversation has come up a lot and and i touched on it earlier about when we see some techs that are overselling themselves or you see some owners and you're like, I hired that guy and he said he could do, he was great at this. And I get him in here and I see this in the group a lot of the time. I hired this guy and he said he was great at diag. Well, he can't diagnose his way out of a wet paper bag. Well, so why does he think he was good at diag? Well, if he came from a dealership where he knows that one product line really well and he, he kind of has a... He doesn't uh, diag, he's memorized all the pattern failures. He has a feel and a lot of known pattern failures, Right. He did diag. He did it, and he was good at it. He got it done. I didn't know how much I needed to know and how much I had to learn till I walked out of the dealer. Didn't know. I thought I was. I thought I was something special. Man, we hired a guy years ago who was, you know, fantastic, great diag guy. He gets a battery drain, and I got to show him how to set up his meter to mm-hmm. check it. And- yeah. <laughs> yeah, Come but on. your see, facial expressions do not transfer yes. uh, through audio. But. I did. The, I got the face for radio though. But yeah. now I'm I'm to the point now where I'm showing the guys the other ways of doing it. You know what I mean? Oh, what about volt drop cross fuse? You never seen that method before? <gasps> okay. What about not unhooking the thing and leaving the clamp on, right? And doing it that way. Like we all old school it. And I still listen. I still old school it a lot because I'm a visual person, right? And depending on the size of the draw, there's nothing wrong with putting the tessellate in between and watching what it does. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm to the point now where I I'm so inversed in this in this industry of different ways of doing things that I don't sit down with too many other cats in the shop, and they know more different methods to do it than me, right? I can say, have you seen this method? And they go, no, I haven't seen that. How's that work? They're still going to go to what they're familiar with. I don't blame them at all, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Time is money. You go with what you're most efficient and effective at. 
But I don't believe that there's a ton of techs out there that are necessarily intentionally overselling themselves. I just believe that in their little box of what they do and what they've done. That's a very true statement. Right? That they just feel like they're good at it. And let's be real. I'm not going to sit. There aren't many guys that are going to sit down and say, I suck at air conditioning. Don't even give me an air conditioning job. I'll do it when I sit down and do an interview. Because I am I want to be totally transparent. I had, I had a tech, I don't know, 18 months ago, interview and ask him about his previous place of employment. He was the shop foreman at his previous place of employment, 10-bay shop, does decent volume. And uh, I said, well, you know, what happened? He said, I got fired. I said, what did he get fired for? I said, I don't know really. I don't know really the reason that I got fired. They didn't really communicate it with me very well. But he said, I'm going to be honest with you, I was being overpaid and I don't need to be a shop foreman. Wow. What? What a great answer! Yeah, it was yeah, like, that guy earned okay. a lot of respect, and he's <laughs> he's a he's a great teammate now. Yeah, and he has the support that he needs, and he's not asked to deal with the the problem vehicles and the problem diagnostic issues. Uh, he's supported by the shop foreman that we have in that facility, mm-hmm. and he's he's a role player, and uh, so that was super refreshing. Um, the other thing that came to mind when you're talking about techs that oversell themselves. And it, because it feels like if you're if you're running around a lot of owners, they're going to say that every technician says they're the best tech they ever met, right? I'm mortified about the evolution from ASOG and changing the industry. Like ASOG is great for a conversation with primarily just owners. Mm-hmm. And changing the industry, I, I have to remind myself that everybody's in there. It's not it's not just us owners yeah. anymore. Yeah. And there's some accountability to be held there. And I'm like. Holy shit! A lot of the people in my in my company are in that group, mm-hmm. and I'm like, oh my god, I'm saying all this stuff. Is that the reality on the ground, or is that my perception of what I'm hoping it is? And are you getting a ton of Facebook messages from people that work for me that are like, Mike's full of shit? That's yeah. not what it's really like. I, uh, I myself have not, <laughs> right? Or or yet, any, I haven't had yet. an I haven't had an advisor or an advisor. I haven't had a technician message me and say. I'm working for a guy right now that that you know you've interviewed or whatever. Now this, if listen, if I do this long enough, it could happen. Right? It's it could happen. happen. But I, I I'm also running in circles now where I'm talking to people and they're like, some well-known techs. They used to work for another shop that I know, from from exposure on social media, and you get a different side of the story. That that person that you see on YouTube that portrays himself as this, man. When the camera's off, it's a different dude. Okay, that's that's human nature. Yeah. But when I when I, I'm I want to be transparent. I want to be so when I sit down and do an interview, I can sell myself, but I'll also be totally upfront with you. And if I say, like I suck at air conditioning, and then if the very first day on the job you hand me an air conditioning job, I am gonna look at you and go, okay, is this some kind of test? <laughs> <laughs> right? Because I want to know. Are you giving me an opportunity? Or question my dispatch ability yeah. because are, I've clearly made a mistake right out of the gate. Are you giving me an opportunity or are you trying to, you know, test me? I just, because I need to know how to tread from there, right? And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I'm just being up, up front. I tell you, this is the very small box that I'm good at, the very small window. I hope that you can utilize it and and we move forward. There isn't a whole lot of techs that they're overselling. We just have to remember their experience, which maybe is one shop, two shops. They were the foreman. They were the go-to guy. And then they get into a place of where through culture and pay and whatever, you got a whole bunch of guys all of a sudden, they were the big fish. They're big fish now. And you're the little minnow again. And you got to maybe bring yourself up to their level. He didn't oversell himself when he said, I can do X, Y, and Z. He just didn't know. On Hondas. Yes. You know, he, or, he, he or, just didn't say that. Or, yeah, I didn't know that I had guy. you had guys in the shop that could diagnose at the level that I diagnosed on one brand on seven brands. My yeah, God, right. I want to get to where that guy is, right? It's a different thing. So they're not overselling. So my message to people that are hiring in a shop, well, think about that though, Mike. Let me, let me finish. If you're hiring a guy in a shop and he comes from a dealership and he says that I can diagnose, I can do drivability, Right. Take that with a grain of salt because some guys can. They can go f- jump from brand to brand. I could. But oftentimes what they were is they were tasked with a lot of drivability jobs at the dealer and they got the cars fixed. Are you going to say because it's only one type of brand that they didn't do Diag? 
You can't say that. That'd be a bold-faced lie. They diagnose cars and they fix them. We have to be much more transparent on both sides of this equation, the hiring equation and trying to get people to come to work for us. Of what is it really you expect? You know, if you expect that I'm going to give you a Ford and I'm going to give you an hour for Diag on it, and then I'm going to give you a BMW and I'm going to give you an hour for Diag on it. If you think that that guy that has only ever worked at the Ford dealer is going to struggle the equally with the Ford, you're crazy. You're crazy. First of all, you shouldn't be charged in the same for the two brands. Should be charged. There should be different labor for that Euro versus that domestic. I said it. I think that works for other shops. But you have to realize, if I had only worked on domestic and then you handed me a Euro, man, I'm slow. Well, I think, and I and I'm slow and I'm cranky about it. What you're describing is you're not wrong, right? Mm -hmm. It requires two people to be more self-aware than is typical. It requires the owner to understand frame of reference, mm -hmm. and most of us don't. Right? Like that's what we talked about last time. Was yeah. my frame of reference was very limited, and it was all of my opinions were based on that limited frame of reference. And it requires a technician to understand that just because I'm the man with Nissan or whatever brand it is, right? It doesn't mean that I'm going to come into an aftermarket shop that does everything yeah. and, and be competent. And, I mean, most most individuals are not going to go into an interview and say, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good with one, but I'm I'm going to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a, you know, just a, a train wreck on everything else. Mm -hmm. Don't you want to hire me? Yeah. So. But in their mind, they might not be a train wreck because they might have got through and got the car fixed. We recently interviewed a guy that was a Honda only guy, and he was pretty upfront about that. Yeah. And we we thought pretty seriously about hiring him because he would have brought a lot of his own clientele. But I see. I always just, I said years tough. ago, ten years ago, if I was going to open a shop in my town tomorrow, I would it would only be domestic, and I would go, and maybe a little Japanese. Right, I might get, say I might do Honda, Toyota, and the three, the big three, and then I would go and try and do my damnedest to poach the top tech from every dealer that I wanted, and then I would get the OE software and the OE scan tool in that shop, and then watch me go, watch me put a herd on the rest of them in town because I could do it because I'm I know how I'm going to sell value and I know how I'm going to sell service. I'm going to take that person, and it isn't about what you produce anymore. I mean, yes, you're going to have to produce but i want you to take that care of that customer and realize that at the end of the day if this one kicks your butt you're not going to go home and you're not going to be rushed to try and get that outside so you can get something better paying in because there is nothing else outside waiting for you we need you to get through this car and then if i start to market myself and my shop that way to those my customers man i'm going to have a lineup of people with those brands you don't think so i think i think you Casting yourself as a specialist and marketing yourself as a specialist works uh, with performance and Euro and to a lesser degree, some Asian. Trying to cast yourself as a specialist in domestic is really difficult because right. everyone expects any shop to be able to work on domestic. But see, that's such a we, when we talked about the diesel side, whether or not it's right or fair yeah, or reasonable, yeah. it doesn't matter. It's with this the consumer yeah. perception. Mm -hmm. So we don't work on any BMWs, Mercedes, Volvos, Volk, Volkswagens, or Audis. Sounds like a great place to work. Uh, Sounds I, like I mean, revenue loss. Is that a mistake? Yeah. Why? I say no. I got to keep up with all the uh, uh, technology and well, scan not, tools I and mean, everything else. You're not going to be doing ADOS calibration or advanced diagnostics on 2022. You know, I feel S, like I make more class, money not right? working on them. They all have brakes and chassis and suspension, and I mean, so yeah. But, but if you're going to work on them, you got to work on them. You got to work on them all. Do you? you can't just do brakes. Do you gotta? Well, so I'll tell you from the dealer. No, you don't. I don't work on any of yeah, them. It but. can be. So, it can be. Hey, Miss Jones. You know, I've always worked on uh, you know car X, Y, and Z for you over the years, and I know that you just. You know, I've taken care of your Lexus and your Acura, but I know you just got this Mercedes, and they're they're wonderful cars. And there's a lot of stuff that we can do on that car, but there's some limitations to things that I can't do. If we ever get in, and it turns out that it's something that's beyond what we can do, I'm going to let you know, and I'm not going to charge you for what we've done to that point. Mm. And so you're still going to pay your tech, and maybe you're going to eat that hour or whatever when you realize it was over your head, 
and you're going to have a referral partner that you work with, maybe a, a Euro specialty shop that doesn't want to work on her Lexus or her Acura. But wants to work on a Mercedes. But you want to do her brakes and her tires and her chassis and, and the things that you can, but maybe you don't want to work on her you know, communication fault error or whatever it might be. Um, there's no reason to turn her away for that as long as you're communicating well and you're managing expectations well because she wants to do business with you whenever possible. Yeah. And she'll go to the other guy if she has to, but she prefers to go to you. So I see two things. There. I was hoping you would just agree with me. I don't <laughs> really want to have to work on that stuff, but you make a good argument. <laughs> so, so here's my uh, counter argument to that is that the reality, though, as I see, is I've seen too many shops when they do do that. And they say, for example, mm-hmm. like I worked in a tire shop and they brought in all kinds of brands. Sometimes we would be we'd be a Mercedes, we'd be having a BMW in there, right? And we had a snap-on scanner and that was it. They don't play well with that Euro stuff. Mm-hmm. It doesn't. And now it's gotten better. But I'm talking way back in 2006. It was not that good. It's getting worse again. I, yes. I don't even know how to reset a maintenance light on a BMW get, or a Mercedes. I got to get my phone out and Google it. Yeah. See. Right. So what I found is that a lot of the time we would have to say, okay, we're going to do the tires, the front end, the brakes on that Mercedes, and it's going to go across one block up and over one block to a guy that only works on that brand. Well... My boss was forever saying, I can't believe that son of a bitch charged us X amount, X, Y, and Z to go in there and figure out that it was one bad coil and he put coil in. Like, what a... That's not good culture. It's not helping your partner in the industry, right? So if you're listening and you do that, stop it. Because you either make the choice that you're going to tool up and train up and to do, do all, all of it, of it yeah. or whatever you can't do, Shut up and quit complaining about what somebody else is going to charge you for it because you'd do the same damn thing if you could get away with it. Well, maybe maybe the answer is, you know, Miss Jones wants one person that she calls yes. whenever something with wheels has a problem. Yep. And, you know, Miss Jones, my job is to be your car guy. If anything that has wheels has a problem, you call me and I'm going to fix it. And if it's outside of what I can help for you, I can either point you in the direction of somebody that can help you or I can just be your advocate, mm-hmm. and I'll take it to that dude, and I'll manage the whole process. I think that's the right for way you. to do it. And then that's going to be a better option and, for and me. And here's what's going to happen. Like you know, that. Here's the thing. Now, if it has to go to that specialist, here's he's a specialist, and he's he's probably more expensive than me, and I'm going to charge you a little bit for handling that process. Mm-hmm. So whatever he is, it's what he is, and then whatever I am is going to be a little bit more than that for handling that interaction yep. for you. Yep. Uh, but you still only ever have to talk to me. Mm-hmm. Um, now, if you're willing to provide that level of service, that's a level of ass pain that a lot of people don't want to go through, right? But that's going to create lifelong customers and fiercely loyal customers. And that lets you work on their Hondas and their Toyotas yeah. and, and their Mazdas and everything else Absolutely. that we're good at that they're already bringing to you. So let me bring another ripple into that conversation. How about the liability of, say, he doesn't do it to... Now, and it's, I, yeah, I understand you're only going to refer to them to somebody that you have a rapport mm-hmm. with and you're familiar with and they're competent. But let's, we're all human. Yeah. Let's say something goes wrong. Say he screws the pooch in some way. In some way, and, and Mrs. Jones is now not happy. Well, she paid, she paid me. She didn't yeah. pay him. Right. It's my job to make it right. Right. So either I'm taking it back to him and working it out with him or I got to find somebody else to deal with it and I got to eat it. And I see well, oftentimes what happens too many times is you wind up eating some until you're right back where you talk about Chris, where it's better like off just saying no. Better off just saying no, or I got to finally get on board and I got to get tooled up and trained up so that I'm not subletting Mrs. Jones because right. I want to keep it all for myself. Not Sometimes when we say, I want to keep it all for myself, we look at that and go, that's greed. That ain't greed. That's keeping it where I'm in control. That's maintaining quality. Yeah. Yes. Right. Um, and, and then, I mean, can you charge enough? to cover your risk when you're subletting it out? Because it's one thing to just say, I put a guy in there and I had to drive it over and I had to pick it up. Well, that was it, an extra hour and I charged the extra hour to Mrs. Jones' sublet. That's it's, one thing. It's it, the, the it's your due diligence in finding your sublease or, or your subletters that you trust to, to do a quality job. And if they screw the pooch 5% of the time, you're going to flush them and find somebody else. But if it's 2% of the time, that's a, an allowable risk. Right? I think it is going to increasingly become difficult to be a one-stop shop for everything. It's going to become increasingly desirous from uh, a shop owner position to specialize right. because of the cost of equipment and, and data access 
is becoming more and more for every well, brand. Uh, also, if it's like a symbiotic relationship where you got a European shop that's sending you all the Hondas and Toyotas, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, it's that a little easier long. to swallow. But, I mean, the big thing is, from a consumer standpoint, everything in the consumer-driven marketplace right now is going towards convenience. Anything you can do to remove friction from the consumer's experience is good. She doesn't want to have a dude for tires and a dude for uh, her car, but her husband's car goes to a different dude, and then none of them do inspections. I got to go to the quick lube place for the inspection. You know, it needs to be. Yeah. They want one call to fix anything that has to do with cars. Yeah. And you need to provide that. Because I know when I was at the dealer and I saw the sublet thing happen where we were once in a while. Um, I can think of this scenario where it would come in and it had been from another shop and it came down to us for uh, a recall. And while we do the recall, what they would do is they would add on a multi-point inspection to every car that came in. This was Nissan's procedure. Mm -hmm. Well, that meant that it didn't matter if it was just there for a Takato airbag recall. It went on the rack and I checked everything out. Mm -hmm. Well, here's what would happen a lot of time. Their trusted mechanic that is just sending them up there for the Takata recall. Maybe he's only ever done all the changes on that car. I do my due diligence on my multi-point, and I go, there's a ball joint falling out uh, of that. Yeah. There's a tie rod falling out of that. The brakes are shot. The tires are worn. Guess what I'm just going to do? I'm going to do everything in my power to poach that customer yeah, from that person, right. that trusted person. I'm going to steal Mrs. Jones. That's my goal now at the end mm-hmm. of the day is to steal Mrs. Jones. That's just business. I felt like a lot of manufacturers were putting out bullshit recalls just to do that. That's well, a really good point. It, it, and <laughs> I didn't I, even think about that. Li- no, I'm, really I, I'm not an engineer, so I'm not smart enough to know. But I would see some, like, I think of the one um, my friend talked about, and I was already out of Chrysler by the, but then an airbag recall, where all you did was take the emblem off the front airbag. Because it might come on. Because the out. projectile, when it comes off, the airbag goes off. It could, you know, the emblem could. Scratch you. Scratch you. Well, let's be real, right? If the airbag goes off and it only scratches you. you done all right. You've done all right. So, but. So is recalls driving traffic back into the dealer? I think we're all crazy if we think that it isn't part of the planned obsolescence of the vehicles when they're built, that at some point we're going to release a recall and that's going to drive a bunch of vehicles back into the dealership. And then if I can whack them for that oil change while I got them there, because this is you've heard me talk about this before, customers want convenience, like you said. So I'm going to hold off on doing that oil change until I'm going in for the recall and they can do it while they're there. I don't want to have to go to two spots. Well, right? make no mistake. There there are aftermarket service providers around the country right now that search for open recalls yeah. on every VIN code that comes into their shop, and they offer the option to the client, would you like me to schedule this recall for you and manage it for you? I'm not at a place where I can logistically manage that, mm-hmm. but you know they're doing that to keep that dealership from poaching their customers. Yeah. Uh, or uh, being a little over aggressive on the on the DVI and selling selling stuff that maybe isn't really necessary. Mm-hmm. Well, when we started out eleven years ago, I didn't want to do state inspections. I didn't want to do tires. I didn't want to do alignments. You didn't want to do the stuff you didn't want to do. R- right, and I got screwed into doing all that stuff because <laughs> I had I had certain customers that I needed to be a one stop shop. Yeah, and the other people that I relied on to do that for me kept letting me down. Mm-hmm. So the thought of trusting a European repair to someone else. I, do you still work on Brad's trucks? Yes. My favorite leprechaun? Yes. Angry little man. <laughs> he had to be the one that forced you into doing tires and shit. So yes, can I ask absolutely. you, why do you feel like they were letting you down? Oh, because you, I take it to have an alignment and the steering wheel would be crooked. Yeah. I, or, or or I'm their biggest customer because I'm going to bring you, you know, a bunch of money in tires and I get no deal. I don't need the deal. Just just. Do the damn job. Be reliable right? yeah. and let me know when I'm going to have it back. Do it in a reasonable time exactly. and actually follow through with what you promised. Yeah. Right. So uh, Lucas I'll, is eyeballing us. Yeah. I want to. I want to ask you, and this will, this will kind of wrap it up in a good way. We'll go back to the bottleneck thing. You said you're the bottleneck within your business right 100%. now. Hundred percent. So what are you, Chris? Are you going to do, Brian? Brian, excuse me. <laughs> That's all right, to, John. <laughs> to to rectify that, what are you going to do about that? I'm going to share it with you guys because you guys hold me accountable when I when I see you in person and we talk about it. You talked about you're going to hire an advisor. Yeah, uh, yeah. Think, are you I or think, are you not? I think Patrick needs to be your advisor. I do too. Patrick, if you listen to this, so what's stopping to Patrick brother. from doing it? 
Uh, money? He's been challenged yet, has he? I'm the bottleneck. <laughs> you know, Patrick's, I, is it money? No. Or I you mean, just don't want to relinquish control? Patrick's my brother, and right. he are 50-50 in everything. I, I just I don't think um, I've asked him about it or pushed him hard enough to do it. I just do it. I think tomorrow that you make that your goal. Agreed. He's not going to be happy. But who is the boss? You or him? Well, you're 50-50. Yes. So is he going to ask he, once? Once he lets me steer the ship, but we do everything. So once together. once you put him in the advisor role, what are you going to do? Because you're going to put more work on him, and you're going to take some work off yourself. I, what are you going to do? I got to find the next move. You know, we got to find shop number two. Or, is that or, that's yeah. a goal? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, so. so you're still at a so, point where you're not marketing at all. No. So you need you need to have the time to grow your existing business to maximum capacity. Right. I need to be a shop owner and start doing yeah. owner status. Stuff. You want to yeah. need to work. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Don't work in the business. Work on the business. Exactly. I love it. I love it. Well, gents, I want to thank you, man. This has been... I feel I like we would have talked for three hours if Lucas wasn't giving us the side eye. <laughs> yeah. well, we're, we're... I got so much more to say about Mike Allen. You're going to have to invite me back because we haven't even got to the good stuff. So Mike and I recorded not that long ago, and I already told him there would be a part two. It's going to be a probably. We're going to probably hit in the double digits with how many times we have Mike on because Mike is an awesome guest and I'm a just not allowed to talk about Atlantic City. Ooh, was that Oof. some stories from the? What back? about Vegas? <sighs> I'm try. I would love to go. I want to do the Apex and SEMA. I have not made it. Let's uh, go this year, yeah. man. We're all going this year. Let's go. Give me a buttercup. So, okay, but remember what we talked about. They only let a few Canadians, so you got to get your tickets early. Yeah, and and I'm, I suck at air travel, so that's that's another story. <laughs> Just for another take time. one of the buses from work. <laughs> yeah, I could do that, but make so, sure it has AC. I, you got to remember, I've got a book when I when I go, I'm booking my time off from my own my yeah. shop, right? So I'm I'm using up my holiday pay to come to, it, which I'm not saying Apex and SEMA wouldn't be a great thing, but I, I'm I'm going to be at AST. So maybe by then, I would you if you're going to be at AST and you're going Absolutely. to be AST, we're going to sit down and we may discuss what you've done since this point to how did that transition go. So Ooh, that's that would some accountability account- shit yeah, right there. Absolutely. So so the first time I ever went to SEMA in Apex was with his dad. Oof, don't you know, tell stories about that. He, he, well, I mean, he was going to go. Yeah. And that's the kind of guy he was. I said, James, can I go to SEMA show with you? And he's yeah. like, sure. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. My uh, first time in Vegas, first time at SEMA show in Apex that, was with That's probably James how you Allen. learned that when you're parking at a certain type of bar, you back into your parking space so that you can escape more quickly in case you're running out the door. Uh, well, th- th- also also <laughs> met your dad at Winston-Salem one time. And I had a little run-in with some cops. <laughs> this also, we, real quick, as I'm my first time in Vegas with your dad, and I think it was Terry Hubbard who mm-hmm. owned R.O. Writer at the time, mm-hmm. And we were at a blackjack table, and I'd never done anything like that. Mm-hmm. So we were playing, having a good time. And when James and Terry left, the dealer said, if you're ever at a table with two guys playing like that, leave. There's <laughs> no way you're going to win any money. <laughs> Why did he wait to the end to tell you? That? Well, because I mean, yeah. they were losing a lot of yeah. money, and they were good tippers. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I want to thank you guys. This has been this has been awesome, and I mean – I, I can't think Lucas is lo- is listening um, for for having me come down here. You yeah, know what man. I mean? And be here on the 4th for you guys to celebrate this. And I mean, and it, you know, it's not just about the 4th. We could have done this on any, on any day. What's it going to take to get you to move down to God's country? <sighs> so what I've seen of the, of the fishing around here, there's not enough right now in local North Carolina for bass fishing that it may, may move. So bass, you can pack bass your fishing, toolbox no, and leave your torch. Do you like fly fishing? No. That's, yeah, that's, that's French for, broad is world class for that. Um, yeah, but that's so you take a really long, lightweight rod and you tr- fish for little tiny fish. That ain't, that's not fishing. <laughs> I don't fish at all. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so the appealing states for right now, Texas is looking really good for a fishing thing. Um, you got to remember, like I'm, a, I'm, I can see Lake Ontario from my front step. Lake Ontario is home right now to some of the. Well, it ain't. It isn't. Maybe it's the best smallmouth bass fishery in the world, bar none. Now, if you've never caught a smallmouth, you're not going to understand what I'm talking about. But if you have, and then you realize that we grow them, some of the biggest ones in the world, and we certainly grow the most aggressive ones in the world, it is a really hard thing to leave. But as I've been down here and I've seen the, 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 the friendliness of the people, 
and the way that this so much passion for the industry is right in this state it is very tempting when i you know my phone's been blown up all day long what are you doing there when, when are you moving here it is very tempting it honestly is and it, and you guys that run good shops i'm only here to try and make people aware that there are gentlemen like yourselves that are doing it the right way and that there are don't stay where you're not happy where you're not treated right get out there don't oversell yourself but have a very transparent conversation about what you can do and what you can't and what you're looking for and what you're not and go out there and have that conversation and find the people that will appreciate you and go there and do it because every time that i in in, in interact with more and more people like yourselves that that are advocating for the industry and appreciate my perspectives and i appreciate yours man it, it just charges me up again it makes me you know go back to the canadian rust and all that kind of stuff and feel like I'm, I'm making a difference hey if you could do me a favor real quick and like comment on and share this episode i'd really appreciate it and please most importantly set the podcast to automatically download every tuesday morning as always, I'd like to thank our amazing guests for their perspectives and expertise, and I hope that you'll please join us again next week on this journey of change. Thank you to my partners in the ASA group and to the Change in the Industry podcast. Remember what I always say, in this industry, you get what you pay for. Here's hoping everyone finds their missing 10 millimeter, and we'll see you all again next time. <laughs>